County Talk back with another Pavers perspective. Uh, we've got Lee Curtis with us uh, again for this episode. Lee, how are we? Yeah, very well, all things considered. Yeah, surviving lockdown. Um, it's been tough, struggling like the rest of the country, you know, trying to keep myself entertained. But um, as long as everybody's safe and sound, that's the main thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to quickly say we are trying our hardest to keep this as high quality as we can, uh, but it is hard considering. Uh, the current times but uh, yeah I'll let Tom kick it off with some quick fire questions yeah cheers Lee um, we're going to I'm going to ask you like a few questions and all I want you to do is first name that pops into your head or first name that pops into your head so don't really think about it too much <laughs> um, right okay yeah we don't want it to be we want to kick off on a, on a positive note considering yeah. what we're probably going to be talking about later so we'll go through all the positions so there's not many to pick from but I want you to think about a certain penalty today so best goalkeeper of the season Slocum. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, best defender? Connor Rawlinson. Best midfielder? Michael Doyle. Best striker? Oh, good question. Carl Wooten. Yeah, exactly the same as what I had when I was uh, writing these down. Yeah. <laughs> Literally exactly the same. I think defender would either, for me, be Rawlinson or possibly Kelly Evans, but I'm a massive fan of Kelly Evans, so... Yeah, Ke- yeah. Kelly Evans has been very good when he's when he's stepped in. I think, um, I mean, Ben Turner and, and Colin Rawlinson at the start of the season were absolutely fantastic together. Um, I mean, if Alex Lacey had been here all season, you'd probably be talking about him in the same vein as Colin Rawlinson because I think he's been an absolutely exceptional signing. Um, yeah. He's been absolutely quality since he's arrived at the club. The way he's settled in straight away. I mean, he is a defender, a bit a bit different to Rawlinson in the fact that. Rawlinson is quite rugged and no nonsense, whereas Alex reads the game very, very well. And I think his partnership with Connor has has been absolutely unbelievable. Really, when you consider, you know, the amount of goals that they've they've shipped in together, they, you know, they've kept it very, very tight at the back there. And that's probably one of the main reasons why the club are up where they are at the moment. You know, I think only Solly Hall Moors have got a better defensive record than Knotts at the moment. So it just goes to show you how good they, they've been at the back. Yeah, exactly. I think if you look at minutes on the pitch as well, I think Dennis is in for a shot with Wooten. Oh, I mean, I mean that's why it's a very, very hard question. I mean, it's interesting. We did a, a a guy from Notts County Stats did a piece for us last week on you know biggest goal contributors, and Christian Dennis was was led that uh, in terms of the goals he scored and ones that he's had a hand in. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's been phenomenal, really. When you think. Back to the start of the season, there were large chunks where it was Wooten and Thomas that started every game. To have scored 15 goals in that climate um, is an unbelievable return from him. And uh, you know, I think he, he's a fantastic striker. I mean, the goal he scored against Aldershot, you know, the lob was. Uh, he, I'd, I'd probably go as far to say that he's, he's, he's the best natural finisher at the club. Um, yeah. But in terms, I think of all round game. Um, I do like Kyle. I think he's you know he's quick. He's he's strong. He's, he can do bits in the air and, you know, he scored some cracking goals this season, a, a wide variety of them. If I think back to the goal he scored against Bromley earlier on in the season, he scores headers, he scores great finishes, he scores tappings. You know, he is, you know, almost a complete centre forward. Yeah. Um, three more. I've got three more quick questions as well. So these might take a couple of seconds more to think about, but um, well, best home best home performance? Oh, great question. I ooh, it's a toss up for me between Chesterfield at home or Eastley and I, I think I'd probably go for Eastley in terms of the dominance that they showed and the quality. Um I mean Eastley are have still got some very, very good players there, the likes of Andrew Boyce of course, who's who is at knots. Um but I think the way they played that game in such what was a, a weird almost surreal atmosphere because I, I think a lot of us didn't expect to be at the ground on, on that afternoon but the, yeah. the way the players stuck to the task uh, and some of the goals they scored were absolutely phenomenal um, and I think that it just overshadows the Chesterfield one which I thought was a, a fantastic performance from start to finish um, I mean Baldwin scored probably one of the goals of the season in that game but I think in terms yeah. overall uh, in terms of dominance and the chances they created 
plus they kept a clean sheet as well. I don't actually remember Joe McDonnell making a save in that game. So it just goes to show you how dominant they were. Um, and for me, that's probably the best performance. And I think that underlined just what form the club are in at the moment. Yeah, it was. I, I've got to say, I'll probably agree with, with the easy one. Um, best away performance then? That one's easy. I think Barrow. Yeah, 100%, 100%. I, I, it, I mean, I would have said I would have said filed um, before that, or probably Yeovil in the FA Trophy. I mean, I loved the performance at Yeovil in the FA Trophy because I think that was not so much about what Knotts' ability is on the pitch. I think it's more about what they were in terms of spirit, fight, togetherness, you know, sticking up for one another, one another defending with nine men for twenty minutes like they did to get that first win at Yeovil which I think was like the first since 2005 or something ridiculous like that yeah that was a great performance but I think knowing how dominant Barrow have been throughout the course of the season the way that Barrow played when they came to Medellin and won 3-0 you know there was a score to settle there but the way they did it the way Neil Ardley changed the shape he made everybody go man for man win your individual battles and I thought that was probably a complete away performance again um I know Barrow missed a penalty and they hit the post, but aside from those chances, um, they kept a team that had been free scoring at home largely at arm's length. And, you know, by the end, they could have scored three or four. I mean, I, mean, I think back to the chance that Callum Roberts had when he, after he'd scored when he went clean through, you know. So that, for me, was a, was a terrific performance. Um, and I think the Fylde one as well, I think you have to mention that. That was very difficult Tuesday night game had been called off what is it three times yeah and to go there on a Tuesday night bad pitch they've got some very good players I think we've heard Neil before talk about Walker Um, and Williams is obviously a threat uh, to go there uh, after the Hartlepool defeat um, when the pressure was really on to go and get a win there in in such trying circumstances was phenomenal but for me if I was to pick one yeah definitely Barrow (laughs) yeah I agree with that so I've got one more this one might be tricky, so it can be home or away. Yeah. But um, the best atmosphere this season. Crikey, that is good. That is a great question. Chesterfield at home was good. That uh, was good, yeah. I thought Eastley was quite good, you know, at home. You know, to say what was going on. Yeah, Eastley was good, yeah, yeah. Eastley was good. Um, I mean, it's a weird one. But I thought the atmosphere for the Dagenham game, when Doyle scored that goal, the noise that, oh, that yeah. goal created. I mean, there was only probably about 2,000 fans in the stadium. It sounded like 20 when he scored. Um, but yeah, I'd probably go for, probably go for Chesterfield. I thought that was, that was very good. Uh, in terms of away, um, difficult one, isn't it? I'm trying to think think back. I mean, because the, pro- the problem with a lot of non-league grounds is they're open-ended terraces, aren't they? So you don't really get no. Feel for the atmosphere, but Solihull, Solihull away was pretty good. Yeah, Solihull was good. Yeah, are we going to do the song? <laughs> We're not. <laughs> I, I don't have it in me. <laughs> I don't have it. Uh, yeah, Solihull away was good. Yeah, I mean, and that was another impressive win when you when you look back at that. I mean, you know, Solihull very very direct. I mean, the two games weren't a classic, but the way Knotts defended, hung on, and then took the chance when it mattered. You know, was was brilliant, really. Yeah, and so I remember was it. Slocum save at the end of the. Oh, yeah, what that's that? s- stunning. Um, yeah, but yeah, that wraps up my uh, my quick fire questions. So it's nice to get a bit of positivity and remember some of the better parts of the season and the better players. But uh, George, you want to go on? I'm going to I'm gonna quickly part? quickly butt in then and add one in before cool. before we move on. Goal of the season. Great question. Um, Brindley. I mean, I had to choose one the other day, and I think Doyle's. I mean, Brindley's was great. There's been so many. One that get talked about as much, and I and and I think it probably doesn't do it enough credit. Really, is is the goal that Sam Osborne scored against Maidenhead on Boxing Day? Was it? I mean, when I look back at that goal the other day, uh, so I did a, I, I chose my five top goals of the season and watch that goal if you can go back and watch it the way Notts moved from one side of the pitch to the other in just one sweeping move and then to finish it by wrapping the ball in the top one an unbelievable team goal you know if that had been scored in the Premier League people would have been raving about it but I think in terms of just 
pure once in a lifetime stuff, you got to say Michael Doy. I mean, that goal. I, I suppose if you give the ball to him nine times out of ten, he he might not hit it on target. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, you know the fact that he did it in the last minute when the legs would have been tired. You know, the not so under a lot of pressure to try and get through because they didn't want the replay on the Tuesday night. They wanted to go to file, but the way he just showed incredible technique. Um, and from such a distance, was phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, do you know, do you know uh, it's an underrated goal, a couple of goals, but for me, me, if I had to pick, like you just mentioned, the top five, I'd have Roberts against Barrow. Yeah, that was I a great think that was goal. goal. And underrated, I think, Dennis against Chorley. Do you know where he had his back to goal on the edge of the area? Yeah. Yeah, um, there's been, the, I mean, the thing that's is, a great goal. Wes Thomas scored an absolute worldie in that game as well. Yeah. I mean, the one thing we've... You know, one thing about Knotts this season is they have not failed to entertain. I mean, they, they, some of the goals they've scored have been absolutely majestic. Yeah, some of, I mean, we're not even talk, spoken about Enzo Baldo. He's got about, he must have four or five contenders for goal of the season. Barnet, Chesterfield, Woken, absolute stunners. So many. You know, and it, it's been a privilege to watch him this season. I, I really enjoy watching him. I always think that they're going to... I mean, there has been some performances where perhaps they've been a little bit pedestrian... But you're going to get that over a course of a season. But by and large, I think they've been great to watch. You know, I love the way that Neil's got them playing. Um, and players are coming into good form at exactly the right time. It's just a shame that we're on this break at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll move on to, then to the next question. Um, so, obviously, there was a media lockdown at the, the start of this season, like over summer. How does that compare to what's going on now with the sort of isolation from the club and obviously the Madeleine's being closed, hasn't it? So, how does that compare? Uh, I'd probably say it's harder because obviously things were still moving at knots at, at that stage um, last summer, um, but this time around, obviously everything's on complete shutdown. Players are at home, you know, they're not going to bring any players in. The the, the stadium shut down, so it's it's been very very hard. But the one thing I will say, the club has been absolutely fantastic in in um, in allowing us to speak to to Neil. Um, and obviously Neil did a web chat for us last Wednesday Alex Lace is doing a column for us now yeah. um, and I, that, that's one thing I, I really do like about Knotts a lot of clubs particularly the further up the ladder you go they, they tend to shut themselves off from the media um, and only sort of willing to help once in a while where Knotts have been absolutely fantastic I can't praise them highly enough especially particularly the, the head of media there, Nick Richardson. If, if I've got an idea in mind, he'll tell me if it's doable or not, but more often than not, it is. And um, that's been great during this lockdown because I you know, obviously get to speak to Alex Lacey on a weekly basis. He's currently doing a column for us. You know, Neil's done a couple of bits and, uh, and there's some other bits in the pipeline as well. I think the one thing that Knotts have done um, as their communication is it has been absolutely spot on. Mm, good. Yeah, I mean, it is true. The clubs have got to be creative, haven't they? Because uh, we're, we're what? The season was, was postponed, is it two, coming up two weeks, just over two weeks? Yeah, yeah. Um, but as this drags on, if this goes on four, five, six weeks, I mean, there's yeah. got to be, you, you've got to run out of things to, to do. It's natural to do that, isn't it? Like, Yeah, I mean, we've done some few nostalgia bits. Uh, there was a bit about Wilkinson, obviously, today, and... Um, we did the other one the other week. I think it was, I can't remember what it was now. Jimmy Cyril, was it? Um, so I think, um, you know, we've got some other bits in the in the pipeline. But you're right, it is, it is very difficult um, because there's nothing, to, there is absolutely nothing to talk about apart from the lockdown. Um, I mean, because it's only so far. I mean, I've got a few bits and bobs up my sleeve to, to do going forwards. You know, I've already done the goals of the season. Um, probably performances of the season like you guys have just mentioned is, is probably one that's in the pipeline as well so um, you know it, it is very difficult but fortunately I think the good thing about Knots is they're very open to to you know giving you help when you need it um, and like I say very very approachable uh, and open to ideas and you know that's great for any journalist really because I think a lot of the further up you go the less connection you have, really, you know, you're surrounded by press officers. You can't get to players as easily, and, and clubs obviously like to publish, like to be 
dominate their own news really they like to set the agenda but Notts have been absolutely superb and you know big thanks to them for, for helping us out of the post and I know like the BBC they've helped out the BBC I know Neil Harvey was on Radio 5 on Friday night so and it's and it's all good for the club I think it shows the club in a good light as well that they're, they're so willing to sort of be approachable and, and to let the fans know what's going on and give them their point of view because they they, at the end of the day all the fans want to hear they don't want to hear my opinion they want to hear what Neil Ardy thinks. I want to hear what Alex Lazy thinks. So, you know, kudos to the club for that. Yeah, it's good to hear, though, obviously, as fans, that the club are like that. Um, <clears throat> now, I, mean, I want you to take, just just put your, your football fan head on. Go on. How would you like to see the season concluded? Because I think I speak for practically every Knots fan and they want to see it finished. Yeah, I, I, I want to see it finished. Um and I don't think Knotts are alone in that at all. I mean, I read a piece today with, I think it's Hartlepool's chief executive saying that they want to finish the season. I mean, obviously, they, they're not actually in the playoffs at the moment, but they've got a good shout of getting in there. Um, now, what we have to remember is, it, you know, health and safety is absolutely paramount. I get that. And, you know, people's safety is, is ultimately everybody's priority. And I could accept the season being made null and void if the season had been played if we played six or seven games, for instance, because then, you know, clubs, it doesn't matter. No promotion or relegation is decided at that that stage of the season. But when you've played 85% and teams have put so much energy and emotion into a campaign, I think you want want to see it get done. Um, Now, whether that will happen, we'll we'll have to wait and see. Uh, You know, and I think... If I look at the top of the table, for instance, people keep talking about settling it by points per game. Um, now, if that was decided, then the likelihood is it would be Barrow first, Harrogate second. Mm. Right, OK. But OK, but the, the, the second place isn't an automatic promotion spot. It's a playoff spot. And as we know from not playing Coventry, the playoffs are a complete lottery. Anything can happen in those games. So for me, I don't think you can decide who the two teams that go up from the National League on the basis of points per game because A, Harrogate aren't in an automatic promotion position and B, it's the playoffs and like I say, anything can happen in those games. Um, yeah. Besides that, Harrogate are only four points behind Barrow in the table. They've still got them to play at Weatherby Road. Barrow have also got to go to Yeovil and I think Halifax, I think it was the other fixture they've got. And It's, it's not inconceivable to think that, that Harrogate or even not could mount a late surge for the title. That you know, it's it's not by any means cut and dried that Barrow are it's not as if they're twenty five points clear at the top and we could all go, yeah, okay, fair enough, they've won it. Mm. Um so that's another reason why I think both Harrogate and Knotts are probably justified in in saying, yeah, we want the season to finish because in the last nine games of the season, anything can happen. It's a highly pressurised environment. You get wildly unpredictable results because players get affected by nerves you know the pressure to perform and that's when you sort of see teams either go on and a great run and then force themselves into the playoffs or come from absolutely nowhere and lift the title which is what possibly not so or Harrogate could do so I, I think in that respect you, you can't settle the season by points per game and now it's interesting because I was on Radio Lincolnshire on Saturday and Mark Hone uh, is a used to play for Lincoln and, and Crystal Palace back in the day. Um, he said exactly the same. Now, from a player's perspective, anything could happen in those nine games. That's why you want to finish the season, because nothing is ever guaranteed. So, for me, I, I, I think they, they have to finish the season somehow, even if it's behind closed doors. And I, and I would hate for that to be the case, because you want the fans to enjoy and share the excitement. But if that's the only way it's going to get done then I think that's something we probably all have to accept. Um, yeah. Sorry, go on, Tom. Um, I just, like like you are saying about how much the clubs and the players are put in as well, we speak to fans at games that are home and away every game. They've invested so much into like travel to games and mm. for that to be effectively for nothing, I think that's, that's a hard thing to take as well. I know some people outside of football say, oh, well, it's only football. Yeah, it's not for some people, is it? It's... It's it's yeah. like it's, it's what they do. It's their life. Yeah, I mean, hundred percent. I mean, here's another thing as well, and, I've, and this was raised at the weekend. Okay, let's say they scrap the season. So, Knotts have got what eight games left. 
however many of those are at home, you know, other teams will have home games as well. So when you pay for a season ticket, you expect to see all 23 games. So what are the clubs going to do for the season ticket? Oh, you don't get them. How are they going to reimburse them? Because they quite likely be justified in saying, well, hang on a minute, I'll pay for a season ticket to see 23 games this season. I've only seen 19 or whatever it is. You know, I'm, I haven't got what I've paid for. So, you know, I noticed Man United saying they were going to pay their season ticket holders, whatever it would be, back. So, yeah. you know, and, and who's going to foot the bill for that? I mean, this is the problem. You're going to get so many questions that people just haven't thought of. That will co- Again, another one. OK, fines for yellow and red cards. If the season's made null and void, does that money get, does that money go back to the clubs? Parachute payments, another one. You oh, know, I read that. Yeah, Yeovil were talking about that, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, 607 grand over a year. OK, it's paid in instalments and I think not getting their final chunk in a, in a lump sum. But if the season's made null and void, then by rights, and I can understand where the Oval chairman's coming from, then if that season technically hasn't been played and is expunged, then by rights, not should get their parachute payment again. So it, there's so many things, um, and I, I would hate to be having to be tasked with making that decision on what happens going forward, because it must be absolutely so difficult to try and take everything on board. Um and I think the easiest way actually out of it for everybody is to get the season played. I think that's the easiest thing to do because any other way you're going to either have legal ramifications and as we've already seen, you're over taking legal advice. I mean, imagine what Leeds and West Brom will be thinking if they're denied promotion to the Premier League. So mm. they're, they're the things that we've got to look out for. South Shields, of course, already taking legal advice on where, um, whether they've got a case because their season's been made null and void. I mean, imagine that. Winning the title with how many? I think they're nineteen points, nineteen points clear or something ridiculous. So imagine Crazy. doing that, and then having the season expunged and told actually, no, you 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 can't go up, you know. So I, I think, with all intents and purposes, as and when it's safe to do so, they have to get the season done. And as I say, if that means playing a block of games over a two week period where teams are playing Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday. Um, I mean, you could get the season done within two and a half weeks, I think. Um, mm. And as, admittedly, that would be a, a very, very hard on the teams with the small squads, but it is what it is. You have to try and get the season done some way or another. Yeah, it, it's tough, isn't it? Because there's so many like financial burdens, such as like if it does have to be played behind closed doors, clubs at this level could buckle under that because a lot of their income would be like ticket sales. There's like player contracts as well. Like, how would that work if their contract expired and then they can't really go to yeah. another club? Because it's it's just a mess, really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it is interesting. I mean, it's it. I, I mean, one of the questions that I wanted answering was whether the players could qualify for the coronavirus job retention scheme. Now, that obviously, uh, according to Dover, it does seem that the players are entitled to be paid eighty percent of their wages. So that would solve some way of paying player contracts until football can resume again um, but then you've got the issue like you say when contracts expire what what happens then loan players go back you know there's so many questions that need answering and unfortunately uh, the National League hasn't been exactly great at offering any kind of clarity I mean the statement that I read last Tuesday I mean, I read it about three times and came up with about three different conclusions of, of what they actually meant. So I think we definitely definitely need some clear communication about what's happening moving forward. But like everything, I think it will be largely dictated by the Premier League and the EFL. I think if the Premier League decide it's null and void, then the, the no, Football yeah. League has no, no option to make their season null and void. And then you just have the knock-on effect. Um, yeah. I, can, yeah. I, I can see it right now that Leeds would be absolutely fuming. Same, same with West Brom, and then you've obviously got the issue of Liverpool not being handed the title, which would just be ridiculous, having been twenty-five points clear at the top of the league. So, uh, you know, there's just so many things that that need solving. It, it's funny because I thought the Maidenhead uh, solution actually looks quite a workable one, albeit that you would probably need to increase the relegation places next year. Uh, mm. But you know that is a, that is a, a a different solution. Um, so, but at least everybody gets promoted. Nobody gets relegated. But at least you 
sort of miss uh, teams saying, well, hang on, how have you promoted them when you could have promoted us? Or, you know, so I don't know. I certainly wouldn't like to be the one making the decision. I think that would be a good idea, to be fair, because in, in spite of everything that's going on, it would kind of be good to see the teams that have done really well um, so far in the season. Like like you said, it, it could be tight at the top, but get promoted. But teams at the bottom where, like like you say, there's nine games left, anyone could get out of the bottom four. In, oh, in sure, Bar Chorley, I think. Chorley are effectively gone, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. But, um, but it, it's teams uh, like that where you'd feel very hard done by being relegated. Yeah. Um, under those pretenses, I think. Yeah. Well, Fire exactly. would have picked up, haven't they, recently? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I think they had two wins back to back, didn't they? I mean, yeah. They had a great, I think they beat, did they beat Dagenham? I think they beat Dagenham, didn't they? And yeah. so, you know, it's like I say, and I think, of course, I think promoting the top four is what Maiden had suggested. That So that would be on a points per game ratio. So if we take that across, across, the, across the course of the season, that would mean. Uh, Barrow, Knotts, Harrogate, probably Oval would would, would go up. So um, it just depends whether the football association are, are that dynamic. I mean, it would solve the problem. They get no complaints about promotion. You know, teams being denied promotion, and then teams that do go up would probably have to accept that. Okay, there's four spots um, to get relegated by. I mean. The only thing, the only fly in the ointment I could see is if they put that out to a vote. I don't think you get many League Two clubs voting to have four down if it was to for a season. Um, no. Because no. if you look at the teams that would be going up, I mean, Knotts and Yeovil would probably do all right in League Two. Barrow, as good as they've been in this this season, um, would they have the finances to be a really competitive? Same with Harrogate. So. But similarly, you've got teams like Macclesfield in in League Two uh, who, who are struggling. I, you know, they're not going to want a vote to have four teams down. I think that's something that they probably have to consider. Um, but if it's for the good of the game and you know, it helps solve this current predicament, then and they want to get the season done and out of the way, then that seems to be a workable solution that's been put forward. Yeah, uh, yeah. The way I, the way I see it as well. The longer this goes on, say. Say we are looking at maybe another four, five, six weeks. The way the National League is, like no one thought Fire would be at the bottom. No one really had Barrow anywhere near the top. Yeah. Um, personally, I think you're going to come back with a, with a brand new season. You could come back and Barrow could be terrible, or um, Boreham Wood might have lost all momentum, and it's going to be completely different. And that's where I think this could benefit Knotts because I think they're in a position to be that top team anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I'd agree with that. I mean, if you look on current form. Uh, I, I felt, um, particularly after the win over Barrow, I thought, right, that could be the catalyst now, that what's needed to go on this charge towards the end of the season. People might look at it and go, well, seven points with nine games to go um, might be a bit of a tall order. But actually, I think it was Martin Samuel in the Daily Mail did a piece about Barrow and said, listen, they, it's OK, when the National League resumes, Barrow want a fair crack at it. Well, you know, promotion isn't all but guaranteed for them. They've won three of the last nine games or something like that, which I didn't realise. So it's by no means cut and dry that they're going to lift the title. Oh, OK, they've largely been the best team this season, but they've never really undergone a sticky patch. So who's to say their sticky patch couldn't be now at the time that they, you know, at the time they need not to be? Um, With the... It, it really is. It does throw up a lot of questions. That's why I'm not really for the points per game. If they're just going to settle two promotion positions, you can't really do it on points per game. I think if you're going to do it, you might as well promote in all bulk, increase the relegation positions for next season and then be done with it. And then you can restore some balance while everything outside in the world comes under a bit of control. Mm. Where, does, uh, where do you see that leaving the trophy then? Because this is well, another issue. Look, the, the, I mean, the talks are that they, they might actually play the FA Trophy as some kind of Charity Shield-style season opener, which um, I think the FA are clearly committed to trying to make it go ahead, and I would want it to go ahead. I, I mean, we have to remember in all this, it's about the integrity of the competition. Um, you know, where, what would it say? Well, uh, about the leagues, if we can't... F- 
if we're de- you know denying teams promotion and relegations it just wouldn't sit right so uh, from from what I can gather and what I understand the FA are eager to play the FA Trophy but obviously finding a date that's suitable um, I mean that again you know you look at the Harrogate uh, Notts County game at Meadow Lane with the with the run that Notts have been on and let's forget the football for one instance I reckon that would be easily a gate of pushing 10,000 which would push which would easily break the record for a semi-final in the FA Trophy, which I think has stood since the 70s. Mm. You know, that's a lot of finance to, to Notts County. You know, and Harrogate, of course, as well, because obviously they get a share of the game seats. So, you know, to, to, to sort of abandon their competition at that stage when it's worth a lot of money uh, to teams. I mean, if you think about it, promotion to the Football League plus the playoff games plus the FA Trophy run you're probably looking at 700 800,000 in total if not so to get the promotion because obviously the parachute payment's worth 600 grand alone so you know you said it's a hell of a lot of money at stake um, so I think the FA really going to have to think carefully before they make a decision as whether, to whether it making the National League null and void yeah so it's yeah. a real tough decision I think that one isn't it it'll be interesting yeah. to see where it goes yeah, definitely, yeah. I just think there's so many... It's almost an impossible thing to call because you're not going to please everyone um, at the end of the day. It's just... No, I don't I don't think anybody truly knows. I mean, it was like oh, last Wednesday, you know, you've got reports in the morning in the national press saying, yeah, league's going to be made null and void, Barrow and Harrogate are going up. And then in the afternoon, you've got clubs saying, well, actually, that's not the case. We're all committed to finishing the season. And then you've got the Boreham Wood chairman, I think Danny Hunter, coming out and saying, well, actually, no, we're committed to playing this season in June, July, August, September even. So, you know, they're yeah. prepared to wait it out as long as possible. And this is my, my problem with it, is the communication just isn't clear. I mean, I, even on Friday, the National League hadn't put any update out on its website. Um, so I, don't, I, 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 I just don't know I think it's impossible to guess what people are thinking I think it'll probably change on a daily basis you'll probably have some clubs saying uh, OK let's play it when we can and when it's safe to do so and then uh, two, or three day, two or three days later when the finance financial situation is starting to bite they'll probably go actually no we can't afford to do this right we've changed the mind so I think it's going to be a, a moving beast in that respect but I think for the integrity of the competition that uh, not just the FA Trophy, but the league. They have to find a way of getting the season done. Definitely, but yeah, completely agree. George, anything, anything else to add? Uh, no, that's that's it for me. Uh, cheers for joining us, Lee. That was great to talk. Um, talk yeah, lots when when there's not so much going on at the minute. But uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people appreciate you talking to us. No problem at all. Any time. Uh, so that was episode four of the Pavis Perspective. Obviously, we've got quite a bit of time on our hands, so. Um, you might may see in episode five, even episode six, as uh, as all this comes to a head, and we, we see what happens with the national league. But if you enjoyed it, um, please subscribe and like the video, and let us know what you'd like us to talk about in episode five.